Aligning people with your vision requires that you know yourself and others. However, it also requires an understanding of the external environment. Bennis identified knowing the world as a key leadership competency. This requires an effective leader to have a holistic view of not just what might affect the organisation's products or services, but what external factors may affect your followers' ability to strive towards the vision. This requires two things. Firstly, the means of assessing what is going on in the external environment, and secondly, the ability to interpret its effect upon the organisation and your followers. The first is achieved by what is known as an environmental analysis. An environmental analysis is not supposed to see all things. That would be impossible. Rather, it focuses upon those things that may have an effect upon the vision of the organisation. So an external analysis starts with the vision in mind and asks questions about the present environment and particularly where it is trending. Viljoen and Dan break this analysis into two components, the macro-environmental analysis and the industry analysis. The macro-environmental analysis. This can be summarised by the acronym PESTEL. Political, Economic, Social, Technological, Environmental and Legal. Obviously, many of these categories overlap. However, it is helpful to understand the kinds of issues that comprise PESTEL. Political factors include potential changes in government and their legislative agenda. Economic factors include potential changes in unemployment, interest rates, inflation, productivity, consumer sentiment and the growth in an economy. Social trends may include the ageing workforce, demands for childcare as more women enter the workforce and more dual working couples requiring greater workforce flexibility. Technological trends include macro-level breakthroughs in communications, processing power, robotics, medicine and miniaturisation. Environmental includes the effects of global warming, recycling, pollution and power saving. While legal includes changes in legislation, particularly regulatory trends or reinterpretations by courts of old legislation. An example of this is the recent focus upon occupational health and safety in Western countries. Viljoen and Dan break down the industry analysis into three sections, each focusing upon understanding trends. Industry analysis, customer analysis and competitor analysis. An industry analysis examines trends in the number and quality of suppliers, the ongoing availability of raw materials, the size of the specialised and general labour market and its educational level, the structure, size and growth of the industry sector itself, the number and quality of distribution channels, costs of raw materials and human resources, trends on product development and service delivery, and examining who are the market leaders and why are they successful. A customer analysis examines, is the industry segmented? And if so, how is it segmented and why? What are customer motivations? What are the unmet needs of customers? And what is underlying customer buying decision processes? And finally, a competitor analysis examines who are our competitors, both direct and indirect. What is their size, growth and profitability? What is their vision and objectives? And who are they owned by and led by? What is their organisational culture? How satisfied are their employees? What is their cost revenue structure? And what are the barriers to entry and exit? Those who have studied strategy before may recognise elements of Porter's five forces, which remain the foundation for most industry analyses. Bowman and Deal suggested that the reason behind the often catastrophic failures of organisations and their leaders is that they fail to see what is right in front of them. That is to say that, even if they had quality information on all of the things we have just considered, they cannot make an accurate assessment of their effects upon the organisation and therefore proceed to make poor decisions. Bowman and Deal note that what is required is a mechanism for organising and analysing all of this data. Relating it to the vision is the start, but we need to consider its effect from multiple points of view. Hampton Turner states that you can't begin to learn without some concept that gives you expectations or hypotheses. Bowman and Deal suggest that one such concept is framing. They define framing as a mental model, a set of ideas or assumptions that you carry in your head to help you understand and negotiate a particular terrain. It can be likened to pattern recognition. When you see something you immediately begin to ask, often subconsciously, have I seen this before? 
Is it similar or different, and in what ways? The same applies in leadership decision-making, where Bowman and Deal suggest four frames for viewing information and the issues that arise from it in facilitating decision-making. The structural frame, the human resources frame, the political frame, and the symbolic frame. In the structural frame, the leader views the problem from the point of view of organisational structure or architecture and asks how it will impact upon goals, roles, formal relationships, rules, procedures, policies, mechanistic efficiency and effectiveness. What are the best ways to group, ungroup, differentiate or divide our labour around the task? How do we integrate and coordinate roles and units within the organisation? And how do we best align our internal structures to the external environment? In the human resources frame, the leader asks how best to empower people in relation to the issue or problem by considering individual needs, skills, individual differences, relationships, motivation, commitment, progression, rewards, learning and distributed leadership. The leader examines interpersonal dynamics and group processes, recruitment and selection, performance management, as well as training, learning, development and career management. In the political frame, the leader considers the issue or problem from the point of view of organisational politics and advocacy by looking at stakeholders, power and influence, politics, interests, conflict and competition. This is done through understanding the processes of negotiation and problem solving, conflict resolution, building coalitions and maintaining or redistributing power. And finally, in the symbolic frame, the leader takes the point of view of meaning maker through vision and values by considering organisational culture, assumptions, beliefs, values and the role of cultural artefacts, norms, rituals, heroes, stories and other forms of socialisation. This is done through understanding the processes of meaning making, interpretation and legitimation of the world, rhetoric and the use of language to represent and shape perceptions of reality and the future. By examining data or information from multiple points of view, we can gain a better understanding of how it will affect others in different ways and particularly how it will impact upon the organisation. Framing is a critical skill in the repertoire of an effective leader.